I live in Boulder City, Nevada, a small suburban town outside Las Vegas. Nestled next to the Hoover Dam, our little community feels worlds away from the glitz and chaos of the Strip. My neighborhood off historical Boulder City Parkway is quiet and friendly. Ranch-style homes dot the desert landscape, largely untouched since the 1950s. My family's two-story house sits on half an acre on the outskirts of town. Joshua trees shade the yard, which is enclosed by a low adobe wall. On hot summer weekends, we normally escape to nearby Lake Mead for fishing and swimming. But that weekend, my parents, brothers, and sister embarked on a camping trip in the Grand Canyon, leaving me alone by choice. At 18 years old, I was deemed old enough to fend for myself for a few days. I just graduated high school and looked forward to a weekend of lounging poolside listening to my music as loud as I wanted. No siblings to bug me or chores to worry about. That Friday after seeing my family off, I cranked up the stereo and spent the day blissfully sunbathing and sipping iced tea. As the sun set, I fired up the Xbox my brothers normally hogged and ordered a pizza. What more could an introverted guy ask for? Full from pizza and mellow from the sun, I decided to call it an early night. I took a long shower and got cozy in my room. As I drifted off around 10, I congratulated myself on the perfect start to my solo weekend. A loud thump jerked me awake a few hours later. I sat up groggily, glancing around my darkened room. Had I dreamed the noise? Straining my ears in the quiet house, I didn't hear anything. Must be the house settling, I told myself before rolling over to go back to sleep. But then came another thump, followed by a heavy scraping sound. This time I was fully alert, adrenaline coursing through me. Fearing an intruder, I grabbed the baseball bat by my bed and cautiously cracked open my bedroom door. The hallway was deserted. I listened again and detected noises coming from the kitchen at the back of the house. Gripping the bat tightly, I crept down the hall, flinching as the floorboards creaked under my steps. Approaching the kitchen entrance, I could definitely hear a rustling commotion. Taking a deep breath, I flipped on the light and leaped into the doorway, bat raised. But the room was empty. Confused, I lowered the bat and surveyed the room. Nothing seemed disturbed. Had I just imagined it? Then I spotted the pantry door ajar. I crossed over and swung it all the way open. A large rattlesnake was coiled around the bottom shelf, rattling angrily. Startled, I stumbled back and slammed the door shut. How the hell had a rattlesnake gotten inside? My hands shook as the adrenaline wore off. Clearly something had entered the house. I checked all the doors and windows but found them still locked up tight. With no sign of entry, I uneasily returned to bed. The next morning I scoured the yard looking for anything amiss. The perimeter wall and gate remained intact, yet somehow that snake had entered my home. I put it out of my mind and continued enjoying my weekend solo time, grateful the intruder wasn't human. But that night I was woken again by strange noises. It sounded like someone stomping around the living room. Certain an intruder was inside this time, I dialed 911. But when the police arrived to sweep the house, they found nothing disturbed and no sign of forced entry. Old houses make odd noises at night, the officer assured me. Probably just the beams and floorboards expanding and contracting. Though hesitant to believe nothing was amiss, I thanked them for checking. The next night I was awoken by the sound of glass shattering. This time I knew it couldn't just be the house settling. Still waiting for police to arrive, I cautiously searched each room, finding nothing out of place. In the living room I noticed a framed picture that had been hanging, now lying smashed on the floor. Before I could investigate further, pounding footsteps echoed from upstairs. Someone was in the house. Wielding my bat, I rushed upstairs and checked every closet and corner. But just like the previous nights, no one was there. By the time the police arrived again, I was seriously questioning my own sanity. Surely I couldn't be imagining it all. But without evidence of an intruder, the officers wrote it off as bad dreams or my mind playing tricks. Though reluctant to be alone another night, the officers convinced me I was safe and just spooking myself. Exhausted, I collapsed into bed, willing myself to sleep through the night undisturbed. Wishful thinking, I awoke a short while later to a loud crash directly above me. Before I could even sit up, icy cold water came cascading down on me as my ceiling caved in. I jumped up with a shout, soaked and shaking. 
What the hell? In the hall stood a dripping figure silhouetted in darkness. I screamed and sprinted for the stairs. Heavy footsteps pounded after me. Terrified, I burst outside into the night and ran without looking back. I only stopped when I reached the illuminated parking lot of an all-night diner. Patrons stared as I rushed inside, dripping wet in my pajamas. I ordered coffee to calm myself while waiting once again for the police. I was near tears, trying to explain the figure chasing me. The officers accompanied me home and searched every inch of the house and yard. But like the previous nights, there was no evidence of anyone being inside. Even the ceiling above my bed was intact, with no sign of caving in. At a loss, the police recommended I spend the rest of the night elsewhere. I gratefully accepted my friend's offer to stay at his place, feeling uneasy being alone. I tossed and turned all night, plagued by what I'd experienced. Come morning, I decided I had to get out of that house. When my family returned from their trip, I begged them to take me seriously about the strange events in the house. But without proof, they chalked it up to an overactive imagination influenced by horror movies. They even seemed disappointed I hadn't cared for the house responsibly while alone. But I knew what I experienced was real. Something menacing invaded our home that weekend when I was all alone, and I never planned to spend another night in that house until we unravel the disturbing mystery of what happened. I've always thought of myself as a rational person, someone who believes in logic, not superstition. But my trip last summer to the remote town of Red River shook my skepticism. After the bone-chilling events of that night, I started questioning everything I thought I knew about the world. There are dark forces that lurk just out of sight, in forgotten places most people avoid. Forces I can't explain rationally no matter how hard I try. This is the story of my unwitting encounter with the unknown in that isolated mountain community. An encounter that haunts me to this day. Red River is located in a remote part of the Rocky Mountains. It's one of those tiny towns that if you blink, you'll miss it. The population can't be more than a few hundred people. It's the kind of place where everyone knows each other and strangers stand out. I was road tripping across the country by myself, trying to clear my head after a bad breakup. I don't usually do things like that, but I needed to get away and be somewhere no one knew me. As I was driving through the mountains, I realized I hadn't seen a gas station in over an hour. The fuel gauge was getting dangerously low. Just as I was starting to worry I might get stranded, I spotted a small gravel road with a weathered wooden sign reading, Red River Five Miles. I breathed a sigh of relief and turned down the road hoping to find gas soon. The road wound steadily uphill around sharp switchbacks. The sun was starting to set, casting an eerie glow over the towering pines. After 15 minutes with no sign of civilization, I was beginning to regret my decision. But then, the road straightened out, and I could see a small collection of buildings nestled in the mountains. At first glance, Red River looked almost abandoned. Many of the buildings had boarded up windows and peeling paint. I didn't see any people wandering the single main street. The only business that seemed open was a ramshackle gas station on the edge of town. I pulled up to the only pump and got out to fill my tank. The gas station had an old-fashioned bell that rang when I opened the door. Inside was dark and cluttered with shelves full of dusty canned goods and junk food. Behind the counter was a middle-aged man in ratty overalls and a plaid shirt. He eyed me suspiciously as I walked in. Howdy, stranger, he said slowly. Ain't seen your face around here before. Just passing through, I replied. Ran low on gas up in the mountains. The man nodded but continued staring with a guarded expression. I paid for my gas and grabbed an energy bar. As I was about to leave, I paused. Say, is there a motel or some place I could spend the night around here? I asked. Don't think I'll make it back down the mountain before dark. The man frowned and shook his head. Ain't no motel here no more. Been closed for years. Nearest one is about an hour back down the highway. My heart sank. I really didn't want to drive on winding mountain roads in the pitch dark. Are you sure? Isn't there anywhere I could stay just for tonight? The man hesitated, scratching his stubbled chin. Well, I suppose you could stay at the old Carter place just on the edge of town. No one's lived there for a long time, but should be a roof there at least. I felt uneasy about staying in an abandoned house, but it seemed better than the alternative. I guess that'll have to do. Can you give me directions how to get there? 
Head back up Main Street till you get to the big oak tree in the road. Take a left there, then just follow the dirt path about a half mile till you see the house. You can't miss it. The man's eyes bored into me as if sizing me up. Folks around here keep to themselves mostly, not used to outsiders. So don't go poking around where you shouldn't tonight, and you'd best get there before sunset. Something about his tone made a chill run down my spine. I thanked him hurriedly and headed out to my car. The main street was completely empty, heightening the feeling that I had wandered into a ghost town. Following the man's directions, I made a left at the oak tree onto a narrow dirt road surrounded by dark forest. The crawl up the mountain had plunged the sky into dusky twilight. Just when I started to worry I had missed the turnoff, an old farmhouse emerged in a small clearing. The two-story home looked worn and neglected, with peeling white paint and overgrown vines snaking up the walls. A few ominous crows stared at me from the roof. But beggars can't be choosers, so I pulled up front and cut the engine. The front door creaked loudly as I pushed it open. Inside was musty but surprisingly tidy. A thick layer of dust coated every surface. The furniture looked decades old, like something straight out of the 1950s. A cup of coffee still sat on the kitchen table, as if someone had stepped away briefly decades ago. I explored the first floor, finding a cobweb-filled living room and small bathroom. Upstairs were two bedrooms with antique brass beds. I dropped my duffel bag in one of the rooms, wanting to sleep on the ground floor in case I needed to make a quick exit. As I descended the stairs, I noticed the sun setting through the back windows. The sky had turned blood red, which seemed ominous. I needed to get settled in before night fell. After a quick microwave dinner, I locked the front door and piled some furniture behind it. I knew I was being paranoid, but somehow I couldn't shake a gut feeling of unease. Exhausted from driving all day, I collapsed into bed hoping for an uneventful night. Sometime past midnight I startled awake. At first I wasn't sure what had woken me. Then I realized the utter silence outside. No crickets chirping, no leaves rustling, no sounds of life at all. The air felt heavy and still as if a storm was rolling in. But when I peered out the window the sky was perfectly clear, filled with glittering stars. As I stared out into the dark woods, I thought I saw a light flicker between the trees. I blinked hard, thinking it must be a figment of my imagination. But there it was again, a bobbing, indistinct glow coming from deep in the forest. My breath quickened. Could it be someone approaching the house? Hunters looking for trouble? Some deranged mountain man who preyed on lost travelers? I ducked below the window frame, debating whether to turn off my flashlight. Before I could decide, the light wavered closer, now distinguishable as a flickering orange glow. Someone was definitely out there, carrying either a torch or a lantern. Fighting panic, I scrambled to grab my cell phone and keys from the bedside table, preparing to make a run for the car. But just as I reached for the doorknob, a chorus of eerie cries pierced the silence outside. The hair rose on the back of my neck. The cries sounded almost... inhuman. Half wail, half howl, like nothing I'd ever heard. Paralyzed by fear, I stood frozen as the orange light grew brighter against the window. All at once, a stampede of footsteps pounded by the front door, accompanied by frenzied shrieks that rang in my ears. The house shook with the force of the stampede. My screams caught in my throat as I cowered in the corner, unable to move. The shrieking and pounding intensified until it felt like the walls were shaking around me. Primal, inhuman wails pierced the night as the stampede raged outside the door. I huddled paralyzed in the corner, clamping my hands over my ears in a futile attempt to block the screams echoing through my skull. It was utter chaos, like the depths of hell had opened up outside this house. The frenzied footsteps and bone-chilling shrieks went on and on, pulsing in unrelenting waves of screeching, wailing horror. I squeezed my eyes shut, praying for it to end while imagining unspeakable horrors passing just on the other side of the wall. It seemed to go on forever, though it was probably only minutes. Eventually, the last set of footsteps faded into the distance, and the unearthly screams quieted. I strained to hear any remaining sounds, but there was nothing except the frantic pounding of blood in my ears. In the suffocating stillness that followed, I couldn't stay in the house another minute. I hadn't checked outside first, so I have no idea what I would have found in those woods. 
Instead, I leapt through a first floor window, ran to my car, and peeled away as fast as the tires could spin on gravel. I drove straight through the night without stopping. Only when I reached the next major city did I finally start to breathe normally again. To this day, I still have no clue what I encountered that night in Red River. Some of you may come up with plausible explanations, but I know what I heard, and I know the gut-wrenching terror I felt was real. Since then, I've tried to convince myself it was just a vivid nightmare, but deep down, I can't escape the grim certainty that I narrowly avoided something sinister in that isolated mountain town. Whatever haunts that forgotten place after dark is something no one should ever encounter alone.